It was December 9th, 2011. It was about three years ago. It was 4 a.m. came around. I was waking up. I was sleeping on the ground in my sleeping bag with my four-man team. I was in Afghanistan. We were going on a patrol that morning. We were leaving at 5.30, and I was up at 4 to do final preparation. The patrol was pretty simple. We were leaving our patrol base. We were walking to a village. We were going into that village, walking around, meeting some of the Afghan people, uh, building our relationships, getting them to really trust us, and then we were going to head back to the patrol base. But as, as Marines, we do very, very detailed planning and preparation. And our planning was already done. We did it the night before, after that day's patrol. We came back, we debriefed, we, we rested, we refit, and we planned. We did a lot of initial preparations. So this morning, we only needed to do about an hour and a half of preparation. We turned all of our names in the night before. We knew everyone that was going on the patrol. It was going to be two units split between Afghan soldiers and Marines. With the names that we turned into our headquarters there at the patrol base, uh, was our ID numbers, was our blood type, that's a big one. Uh, every weapon that we had, every piece of gear that we had, there were serial numbers, we turned all those in. Those were turned into higher headquarters. We had an exact route. So we had a plan, we wanted to go into this village, but we had an exact route, basically step for step, turn for turn, and because we were in two units, we had two, two separate routes. And the routes, they were already on our maps. I already had it highlighted on my map. And because sometimes the map doesn't look exactly like the village, we had alternate routes. We needed higher headquarters to be able to track us, just in case we were in trouble. We planned for engagement with the enemy. We didn't want it. That's not what we were going out there for. But we planned it into our plan. If, some, if they attacked us from the left, to the, from the right, from the front, from the rear, we put that into our plan. We planned for finding an IED, an improvised explosive device. We planned for an IED detonation. We planned for a, for a casualty. That's one thing that we, we definitely didn't want, but it was a possibility, so we planned for it. We're going to take a step back really quick, and I'm going to talk about my family, where I come from. And this is more for comic relief. I'm the little dude in the red sweater, if you're looking. Uh, the, the red sweater is pretty hot. Chicks love it, I'll tell you. I still have it. I still wear it. Uh, I, I come from western Pennsylvania, the Pittsburgh area. Yeah. I, I had an awesome family, very supportive family. I hope that I can provide my family what my family provided me. This is my family. I got two little daughters, which is awesome. But when I was growing up, I absolutely loved sports. I, because I loved sports, I had to love school because my mom wouldn't let me play sports if I didn't get good grades. She was a good mom. I, I didn't like it at the time, but that was it. And it was a homework assignment that ended up having a really large impact on my life. Uh, we had to do a career research report in the eighth grade. We had to decide what it was we wanted to be when we grew up and write about it. Uh, I asked my dad because I had no idea, and he, he recommended the military, and specifically the Marine Corps because I think in, in the mid, mid to late 90s-ish, the Marine Corps had a really good uh, marketing campaign. They had some really cool commercials. And I, I wanted to be one of the few, the proud, the Marines. So I did my report. I did my research on the Marine Corps. And what I found out about the Marine Corps, what I learned, that's what had a big impact on me. Uh, the, the history of the Marine Corps, the stories of valor, the stories of the heroes, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, Battle of Daido, Bella Wood, that stuff was everlasting on me. I knew that there's always going to be someone sacrificing the way they live their life to provide freedom for our nation. And I knew that there's always going to be someone standing that watch, and I knew that, that I needed to be a part of that. So in the eighth grade, I decided I was going to be a Marine when I grew up. I graduated in 2006. I, I became a Marine. I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. And I came out to Camp Pendleton. I did a couple deployments with uh, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines out of Camp Pendleton. And, uh, I, you know, I had an awesome time. My wife and I, we did five deployments combined. I did three, she did two. It was my last tour that I found myself in Afghanistan. And uh, it was very interesting. It was different than anything I had ever done. This time I had a small team of four guys, and we were embedded into an army, an Afghan army infantry company. And our job was to train and mentor and to advise them. As our forces were pulling out of Afghanistan, we needed to make sure that they can continue to keep their country safe. 
So it was a really interesting billet. All right, now I'm going to get back to that story, jump back into it. So December 9th, 2011, we went on that patrol. It ended up being pretty insignificant for the, for the most part of that patrol. We went out. Uh, it was pretty early, so there, there weren't even really that many Afghans coming up. And we talked to a few. Nothing crazy happened. We started heading back to our patrol base, and it was about a five-hour patrol. It's funny, every time I tell this story, that patrol gets a little bit longer, and I'm usually carrying a little bit more weight. But we're heading back to the patrol base. Our plan was to go back, debrief, take our stuff off, uh, get comfortable, and start planning for the next patrol. And that's when it happened. I, I stepped on an improvised explosive device. I, I triggered an explosion underneath my right foot. It was very violent experience. The blast picked my body up and threw me to the ground. I was laying on my back. I had a concussion. At first, I didn't know what was going on, but I was conscious. My ears were ringing, just a high-pitched, a high-pitched, crazy shriek. And I, I wasn't feeling any pain. I began slowly to, to kind of figure out what was going on. I realized I was in Afghanistan. I started putting things together. My ears were ringing. I was laying on my back. I knew something had happened. And I figured I stepped on an IED, because that, that was the weapon of choice for the Taliban at that point. And I knew what IEDs did to people. I didn't feel any pain yet. It was strange. When I didn't feel pain and I knew I stepped on an IED, I thought that there was a chance that I was dying. I remember the two thoughts that, that was going through my head when I thought I was dying. One, I, I thought I was going to get to go to heaven. And you know, it wasn't necessarily scary, but it was, it was just what I thought. I was no longer in control. And the other one, I thought about my wife and my daughter. I know this sounds holly, but, but it's, it's what happened. I thought about my wife and my daughter, and I was like, oh, man, I, I don't want to go to heaven yet. And shortly after that, life picked up. It, life was no longer in slow motion, and it, it began to hurt. My right foot, I, you know, I've, I've never given childbirth, but I couldn't imagine a pain being worse than this, this burning, burning pain uh, I, that I was in. On my, on my right leg. My left leg felt wet. All of a sudden, my corpsman, Doc Schramm, he was 21 years old at the time, he came up to me. He threw his knee into my femoral artery, which made things hurt even worse. He threw a tourniquet on, and he said, hey, sir, you, your leg's a little bit mangled, but you're going to be all right. We're going to get you out of here. As I was looking around, the Marines were carrying out the plan. We have a casualty. We had a, a wounded Marine, and it was me. There was one team that already, they were pushing out for security. There was one team that was already setting up the landing zone for a helicopter. There was one team that was getting the stretcher out to put me on it, to get me to the helicopter. And then there was a Marine, Sergeant Tina Harrow, who was directing everything. It was impressive. It was impressive. 17 minutes after I blew up, there was a helicopter circling and coming my way. I remember looking up at the helicopter and just praying that it got to us quicker than the Taliban did. And all of a sudden, I heard a sound that I did not want to hear. It was a gunshot. The Taliban had showed up. But the Marines that were out on security, they fought them off. The pilot in the helicopter decided to still come down. He came down, landed. The Marines, with a stretcher, put me on it, threw me on the helicopter, and we moved forward. Within 40 minutes, I was into surgery. It was, it was a life-saving thing. It was absolutely amazing. When I woke up after surgery, my right leg was amputated below the knee. There were a lot of bandages on my left leg, bandages all over my arm. I, I, was, in, I was in pretty bad shape, but I was alive. I was, very, I was very grateful that we planned the way we did. I'm glad that we had a plan for a casualty. I'm glad we had a plan for someone stepping on an IED. I'm grateful for the Marines that were there. They were so, so efficient. They, they did their job so quickly. To get me out of there in 17 minutes was uh, absolutely amazing, and that's awesome. We had planned for the unexpected, and it happened. The thing is, though, that morning when I woke up, before when I was getting ready, brushing my teeth, doing the shaving thing, I had no idea. I, I did not expect my life to dramatically change. But it did. We don't, always get, we don't always get to pick the situation that we're in. Uh, but, I mean, the way I see it, you got two choices. You can kind of shy away or, or you can go for it. And, and I think I'm here because 
of the stuff that I've learned in the past three years. Some of the habits, some of the traits, some of the, the, the schools of thought that I've used to help me in the, in the coming months uh, has been amazing. And I realize that it, it translates to other people's lives. So I think that's, that's, what I'm, that's where you guys are going to come into my story. So now I had, a, I had a challenge. My challenge was emotional. My challenge was physical. But everyone here in this room faces challenge. Everyone, everyone has challenges daily, whether they're big or small. Maybe it's at work. You know, maybe it's on the job. Maybe it's when you're planning. Maybe it's at home. Maybe it's personal. But everyone here has a challenge. And what defines our character isn't, isn't necessarily the challenge that, that we're facing, but it's, it's how we deal with it, how we step up to the plate and how we, how we handle that challenge. I had two people that played a really, really big rule, had a big influence on my life early on after I was injured. And, you know, it's funny, when you, when you learn life's lessons, sometimes you think it's going to come from maybe a parent, maybe a teacher, a professor, or a coach, or a mentor, or a speaker. I learned a very important lesson from my five-year-old daughter. We would tell our daughter before we went on deployment that, hey, we're, we're going to work. We'll be back in about seven months. Uh, good luck. High five. I love you. So daddy got hurt at work. Daddy got hurt in Afghanistan. Daddy lost a leg. Daddy's going to be coming home really soon, and we've got to be there for him. My, wife, my, my daughter, after my wife told that, she processed the information. took her about ten seconds. She smiled, and she said, Daddy is going to be home for Christmas. <laughs> what was such a negative event for myself, a negative event for my wife, for my family, for my friends, my, my five-year-old daughter was so quick, so instinctive, so pure that she pulled something positive from that situation. Now, I, I don't know which one outweighs the other, like losing a leg or being home for Christmas, but it was something positive. My wife, my wife told me that in Germany, and it made my day. I remember making a huge deal about it, calling in the, nur the nurses and, and telling them, hey, I'm going to be home for Christmas. And that Christmas, extremely memorable, I was home for Christmas. We celebrated in the hospital. We had to reroute Santa, but, but he still came. And it was actually the first Christmas that we had spent together, my wife, my daughter, and I, in three years because of our deployments. So that is one that I'll never forget. And that's a lesson that, that I learned. And in every situation, there, there is something positive, and you, you got to search for it. And I think it's funny, grown-ups, myself, probably a lot of us, uh, sometimes we, we look at the, the negative in the situation. Uh, I, I, I want to start thinking about, I want to start thinking like a kid again and have just instinctively be able to pull out something positive from a situation because I think that is such a cool attitude. That's, that's the person I want to be around, and that's the person that I, that I want to be. The other person that had a big influence on my life was my commanding officer. Uh, his name is Ike Moore. He's major. He was still in Afghanistan when I got hurt. He knew how to, to motivate me. He knew, he knew what I needed. He sent me an email. This is about two weeks after I was injured. This is when I was still in the hospital bed. He sent me an email saying, hey, Mac, when are you going to run your first marathon? I want to be there. And at first, I was like, ah, oh, what a jerk. <laughs> I don't have a leg. And then I started to think about it. And I had a very big moment where I had a, a mindset change. Instead of thinking about what it was that I couldn't do anymore, instead of, instead of focusing on what it was I didn't have anymore, I need to focus on the future. I need to focus on what I can do. And that was it. He challenged me at running a marathon, and I'm a Marine, so I decided to one-up that challenge, and I set a goal for myself to run an Ironman triathlon. Now, the Ironman, it's just, I, I couldn't think of a harder event at the time. It's a 2.4-mile swim. It's a 112-mile bike, and then it's a marathon. So I went back to him with that, like, yeah, I'll, I'll run a marathon at the end of my first Ironman. So that was, that was big. That was big in my recovery because it, it put me on a track. I went through a few surgeries. I had three surgeries in San Diego, and then after that, I started to do rehabilitation. But I'll never forget the day that my physical therapist came up and said, hey, I'm, I'm going to take you to the physical therapy room here at the hospital. So we got to go, we got to go down the elevator. We got to go outside. I haven't, hadn't seen the sun for a little bit, so it was pretty cool. Uh, we saw some people. We went into the building where the physical therapy room is, and I remember I hit the button 
with the, the open the automatic doors. Uh, my physical therapist wheeled me in there. I had a tower of medication behind me, and I, and I rolled in, and what I saw was amazing. I saw other wounded Marines. I saw other wounded sailors, and I, I saw guys with two amputations. I saw double amputees. I saw triple amputees. I saw guys that, that couldn't stand up. I saw guys that couldn't see. I saw guys whose scars made my amputation kind of make me think that it was a scratch. I quickly stopped focusing on myself, and, and I was focused on them. It was, it was pretty nice to, to get back and to get back into reality, to, to see that my injury really wasn't even all that bad. It was a perspective thing. And not only was it perspective, but I saw these guys doing it. I saw one guy tethered to the ceiling with two prosthetic legs trying to walk, and he was falling and getting up and falling and getting up. I saw another guy who was lifting weights. I saw a guy without legs doing an arm machine. They were sweating. They were laughing. They were joking. They were high-fiving. It, there wasn't a victim in the room. It was amazing. It was, it was a room full of warriors. Uh, I was proud to be among them, and, and I was kind of eager to start with them. So it was, it was really big for me to see that, and it, it a lot of times, it takes that. It takes me seeing something else to realize that the situation that I'm in really isn't that bad. It, it could be a lot worse. I had a physical therapist named Fran who was really tough on me. And later on, maybe a, a month or two down the road, like she, she referred to my single below-the-knee amputation as a paper cut. And that wasn't weird for me. That was normal. It's like, you're right. You may, maybe, maybe you should go talk to the, the triple amputee over there. Because that was the truth. After I was healing, I, I, I was able to start driving again at when, once I was off the medication. In the hospital, the people at the Naval Hospital, they gave me a little blue placard. It was a handicap placard. And I didn't really expect to use it, but I, but I took it anyway, and I put it in my little glove compartment. Uh, but I, I didn't think I needed it, because I didn't. I, had, I have one of the best prosthetists in the world. He makes an amazing leg. He makes me run legs, bike legs, a swim leg. Uh, a, a really good walking leg, and I have all these legs, and I can get around, so I was like, I, I don't need that. But I found, living in, in San Diego, and I drive a truck, that sometimes there's not a lot of parking. And sometimes when there wasn't a lot of parking, I would be handicapped that day. I would pull in to the handicapped place, and I would take the placard out, and I would throw it up there. And the, the sad thing is, I mean, I didn't think there was anything bad about it. One day, I had my daughter with me in my truck, and I was driving around the supermarket, and I think it was around a holiday because there was absolutely no parking, and people were, like, honking at each other, and it was just a, just a bad scene. And I pulled into a handicapped spot, and I took the glove, opened the glove department, and threw up the placard. I was handicapped that day. And I got out, and, and my daughter and I went into the store, and, of course, she had questions. She, she asked me what that blue thing was. And I said, oh, and I explained to her, you know, that's... Well, you know, I don't have a leg, so they gave me this handicap placard. And she said, well, Daddy, you got, you have five legs. <laughs> <laughs> and she continued to ask questions, and it was bad enough. Like, I just, I just wanted to stop talking about it. I, I felt kind of bad. The next time I went to the store with her, she said, hey, Daddy, are you going to use that special blue ticket? And I said, I said no, I, I, I'm not going to use it. I'm never using it again. Like, you taught me a lesson, Lupe. I don't need it. There, there were times that I would go out and run five miles, then I'd go to the supermarket, and I would pull in and use a handicap spot. That, that was, I was using my leg a, as an excuse. I was using a, a disability as an excuse when I didn't need to. There's people who, who probably needed that spot more than I did, so I, I stopped doing that. And I, I, excuses, when there's a problem, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution, and it, any time you come up with, come up with an excuse, uh, you're usually part of the problem. So I'm going to get into the whole Iron Man thing. I started taking, taking steps forward to the Iron Man. Uh, this was a big milestone for me. Because this is the first day that I walked. I was definitely unstable, but this was huge for me. This was exactly two months after I was blown up. Uh, really cool. Like, I, I was impressed that the doctors, the surgeons, the physical therapists, the team got me up and on my feet. Uh, and it was just uh, such an amazing ex experience. So cool. Shortly after that, I, uh, I began to take more steps. Uh, I hopped into the pool, started swimming, because part of the, the Ironman is a swim. 
And it, it took a while to figure out how to stop going in circles because I swim without a prosthetic. But it, eventually you adapt and you overcome and you get past that. Biking, same thing, like I clipped in. I had a bad experience the first time I went biking. I, I had never clipped into bikes before, and, and I did after I, I lost a leg. I rolled up to a red light. I was going zero miles per hour, and I forgot that I was clipped in, and I tipped over. And not only did I tip over, but my leg fell off. And not only did my leg fall off, but it, but it was one of those red lights where there's like 15 cars backed up at each intersection. I think every single one of them has PTSD now, but every single one of them had to come by me and, and ask if I was okay and if I needed help. And I said, like, yes, I, d I don't need help. I'm fine. I'm emotionally hurt right now. Please keep going. <laughs> but eventually, eventually I, I found an organization, ran into an organization who... Uh, it's called the Challenge Athletes Foundation Operation Rebound. They support people, uh, military, military veterans with a disability in getting back to an active lifestyle. And they realized my goal, and they started working with me. I, I started to, they started supporting me. They sent me to a triathlon camp. Uh, I went. I was around other able-bodied athletes and, and a few disabled triathletes. It was awesome. I came back, and they, they set me up with my first sprint triathlon. Sprint triathlon, it's just, I mean, it's a fraction, just a fraction of an Ironman. But, it, I mean, it was, a, it was a step in the right direction. It was another milestone in my journey. I went, it was eight months after I was injured that I got to go and do this sprint triathlon. And it, it was really something special. It was really cool. I, I have a smile on my face there because, uh, well, it might have been a forced smile because it was hard. But it, it was just an accomplishment. It was really cool. I kept moving forward. Uh, the first year, within my injury. I ended up doing three triathlons at Sprint, and I did uh, uh, an Olympic distance, and then I did a half Ironman. So I was making, I was making progress, and I ran a marathon. Uh, I was making progress towards my goal of doing the Ironman. I kept going forward. The next, uh, the next year, so it was a couple months later, I found out that I was selected to be on a team with Refuel Got Chocolate Milk to go run the Ironman World Championships in Kona, Hawaii. And it was awesome. It was awesome. It was, it was really special because, uh, I mean, there's a couple different Ironmans. There's a lot of different Ironmans worldwide, and Kona is like the Super Bowl of Ironmans. So when I, when I set my goal of running the Ironman, I had no idea that it was going to be at the big, the big table. I, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Uh, and it was really cool. Uh, part, of, part of the team that I was on was Pittsburgh, t retired Pittsburgh Steeler Heinz Ward. And it was really neat, because I said I was from Pittsburgh, and uh, I was a big Steeler fan, big fan of his. So that was just kind of an added cool thing. But it was, it was really cool, getting to run the Ironman with Heinz Ward, or getting to do the training. Being selected to be on that team was very special. It was definitely hard, uh, the, running, the, the running and the biking, and getting the legs ready to do that kind of distance was was challenging. Again, I had a really good team. My prosthetist was uh, really, really amazing, worked with me a lot, sacrificed a lot of his time. It was very special. And finally, I got to take my family out to Kona, Hawaii in 2013 in October to do the Ironman. Went out there. It was a vacation for them. It was more of work for me. But uh, it was an amazing experience. They started the swim. It was, a, it was a long swim. It took me an hour and nine minutes. I went a little bit faster than I expected. I, it was probably an adrenaline thing. Got on the bike, uh, started, started biking a little bit. Uh, I forgot to put sunscreen on, so the bike was a little bit, a little bit harder than I had expected. Came back. I was already seven miles or seven hours into the race, and I had to start the run. And I put, I put the run leg on, and I just started going. Uh, at that point, I, I, I really didn't want to do it anymore. I kept going. Mile 17, I don't know why, why I remember mile 17, but mile 17, there were mile placards. I remember asking myself two questions, and one was, how, how did I get myself into this? Because it was hard. I, at that point, I was in a lot of pain. I was trying to figure it out if I should stop, because I know there was a lot of sweat building up under my prosthetic, or if I should keep going. Uh, I, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't, didn't want to keep going, but... Uh, obviously, I kept going. Uh, mile 19, I had to basically come to a stop. I had to start walking. Not only did everything in my body hurt, but also I, I ran out of energy. I hadn't been eating enough. Uh, I, I sucked down a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I took a seed. I took my leg off, 
and I, I dried it off. When I stood up to put my leg back on, my, my limb had swollen so much that I couldn't get it on. So I, it took a while finagling with it and pushing it in, and I had to walk probably another quarter of a mile. But by then, by the time my leg was back in the socket, and by, by the time everything was straight with my leg, the peanut butter sandwich had kicked in, and I started jogging again. And after I started jogging again, I kept going. So Next to finish is retired Marine and challenged athlete Eric McIlvaney. He crosses the line in 11.54.19. look back on the race, I think when it was hard and I was able to kind of dig down deep, it, it brings a sense of pride to me. At that point, like I, I felt no pain, you know, I felt like an Ironman. Become One Team is reunited at the finish line. The long journey is now complete. Thank you. Uh, when I went across the finish line, I answered the two questions that I had asked during that race. And the first one was, why and how did I get myself into that? And I thought back to when I was in the hospital bed, when, when I really couldn't control anything. I couldn't even sit up on my own. The only thing that I did control is I, I had a little, little clicker that when I pressed the button, more, more pain medication would go into my body. And I think I had that thing so maxed out that I wasn't controlling it. So going from there, 22 months later, to to Kona and to finish the Ironman uh, was, it, the sense of accomplishment is like, I, I can't even put it into words, it was awesome. I, I kind of want, I want everyone to feel that sense of accomplishment. It, it, it was really amazing, really neat. The other question, like who would ever do more than one Ironman? Uh, that, that was my question during the race. And uh, on the way back from Hawaii, I, I signed up for two more, so I've done three down. I've done three now, and I'm signed up for two more. Now, I, you know, once you, you reach a goal, you set another goal. And there's a record out there, an amputee record that I'm going to be going for next. So it's it's one of those things. It was awesome. I had the opportunity recently to to talk at a few a few different high schools, and it's kind of funny. Like I, I got the same question three times in a row, and I answered it differently. The first time, the question was, if I can go back to the day that I was injured. Would I change anything, and, w and what would I change? Uh, you know, immediately, I just kind of put on the spot. I, I, I said, you know, I, I probably wouldn't step in the same place. Because <laughs> that's, that's just what I thought of. And it's funny, when you open it up for Q&A, uh, y you got to be ready to answer a question. So I had to give an answer, so that was my answer. But you don't really come up with an answer until, like, you're driving home. <laughs> so so the, the second time I got that, that same question, it, you know, I, I was kind of happy. I was like, okay, I, I th I've thought about this now. And I told him, you know, shortly after I was blown up, those initial days, I couldn't stop thinking about when I was blown up. I couldn't stop thinking about what I did wrong. I, I was retracing my steps, trying to figure out where I lost my focus, trying to do this. If I would have kept focusing on that moment, it would have killed me. At some point, I began focusing on the future. And instead of, instead of thinking about what it was I couldn't affect anymore, let's think about what it is I can affect. The third time I was asked that question, I answered, it kind, I answered it kind of similar to that. But on the drive home, I realized I think I was interpreting the question wrong. I think they were asking a different question. And when I thought about it, if I, if I go back to that day, would I change anything I feel like I've learned a lot of lessons. I feel like I've learned a lot of lessons from my daughter, from my family, from some of the other wounded warriors, uh, from some of, the, some of the high school kids that I talked to, uh, from, from a lot of different people. I feel like I've really grown. I feel like I've really matured in the, in the past three years. My priorities have changed a little bit. You know, the, the path that I was going in the Marine Corps and, and what I saw myself and my family doing in the future, it wasn't the path that I ended up take, taking. My priorities turned into, they went from being all over the place to two main things. And it was the stuff, when, when I thought there was a chance I was dying, it was the two things that I thought of. Uh, going to heaven and my, my wife and my daughter. So my priorities became my faith and my family. And that has led me in my decision-making where I am. If I hadn't lost a leg, I never would have ran an Ironman. I, I definitely wouldn't be up here on the stage right now. Uh, I wouldn't be the, the person that, that I am if that didn't happen. So if I can go back to that day, uh, I wouldn't want to go through the pain again, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change a thing. I, I like who I am. And I think my, suggest, my suggestion to you isn't uh, to go out and the, to step on a bomb 
But, but I do suggest that, that if you have to, just reevaluate what's important to you. Reevaluate what, it, what your priorities are. Figure out what it is that you want to do and then go tackle your work, your, your relationships, your priorities, and enjoy it. Enjoy life. And, and I think that's, that's how you're going to... That's how you're going to lead through anything, through the unexpected. So that's all I have, guys. If, if you do have questions, I'll be sticking around. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>